Lesson 7.7 .7, Exponential Functions Let's first have a review of the rules of exponents. If you have an exponent of 0, any number raised to the power of 0 equals 1. Negative exponents, you take the reciprocal and make the exponent positive. Product of powers, add the exponent. Power of a power, multiply the exponents. Product to a power, distribute the power or the exponent. Quotient of powers, subtract the exponents. So let's do an example of each of these. Power of a power, we're going to multiply the exponents. So for example, if I have x to the fifth raised to the third, I'm going to multiply the 3 and the 5 and get x to the 15th. Product to a power, I'm going to distribute the power. So for example, if I have 2x to the third, y to the seventh, and I square that, I square the 2, I square the x to the third, and I square the x to the seventh, so I end up with 4. 2 times 3 is 6, and 2 times 7 is 14. Quotient of powers, I need to subtract the exponents. Whoops, sorry about that. So for example, if I have x to the 5th over y, or sorry, y to the 10th, over x to the 3rd, y to the 17th, I subtract 5 minus 3 will give me x squared, and since the 5 was larger, the x squared is on top. 17 minus 10 will give me 7, and since the 17 was larger, the y is on the bottom. Exponent of 0, any number raised to the power of 0 equals 1, so I can have 50 billion, and if I raise that to the power of 0, it equals 1. Negative exponents, we take the reciprocal and make the exponent positive. So if I have 5 to the negative 2, that's 1 over 5 squared. If I have a negative exponent in the denominator, I bring it up top. And if I have both, I switch places and make the exponents positive. And a product of powers, I add the exponents. So for example, x to the 6th times x to the 10th, that gives me x to the 16th. So let's talk about exponential functions. Exponential functions are, are of the form y equals ab to the x. a cannot be 0. Sorry, a cannot be 1, b is not 0, and x is a real number. So if we compare functions, a linear function gives us a straight line, a quadratic function gives us a parabola, and an exponential function gives us an increasing or decreasing curve. If I have an exponential function that is going up as we move from left to right, this is called exponential growth. If I have an exponential function that moves downward as I move from left to right, this is called exponential decay. And next, what we need to discuss is how to graph an exponential function. Okay, so graphing exponential functions. So as I said, they're of the form y is equal to a, b to the x, where a is not 0, b is, sorry, a is not 1, b is greater than 0, 
and x is an element of the real numbers. So for our first example, we're going to graph y is equal to 4 times 2 to the x. Now this will be a little different than what we're used to, but I use an xy table on these. To me that's just the simplest way to go. And I'm going to make my coordinate plane. My x and y axis. Now I come over to the left because an exponential won't do a whole lot on the negative side necessarily. So I want to plug in a zero. And as we know, any number to the power of zero is zero. So what I'll get is y, or sorry, is one, not zero. y is equal to four times two to the zero, so that's four times one, so that's four. If I plug in one for x, I get y is equal to four times two to the one, so that's four times two, so that's eight. If I plug in 2, I get 4 times 2 squared, so that's 4 times 4, so that's 16. And as you can see, I'm growing rather rapidly. That's what happens with exponential functions. We grow really quickly. If I plug in 3, 2 to the third, 4 times 8, 32. Now, I didn't make my graph quite tall enough for that. But I'm going to go ahead and show you what happens if we plug in a negative. So if I plug in negative 1, I get 4 times 2 to the negative 1. So that is 4 times 1 over 2 to the 1. 4 times 1 half is 2. If I plug in negative 2, I get 4 times 1 over 2 squared. So that's 4 times 1 fourth, so that's 1. If I were to plug in negative 3, 4 times 1 over 2 to the third, so 4 times 1 eighth, so that's going to be 1 half. Okay, so graphing this, I'm going to plot these points. I have 0, 4, 1, 8, and as you can see, I didn't actually leave myself quite enough room, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my scale real quickly. Make this 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. So I'll have 0, 4, 1, 8, 2, 16, so 10, 12, 14, 16. And then I had negative 1, 2, negative 2, 1, negative 3, 1 half. Now, an interesting thing about exponential functions is they never actually meet or cross the x-axis. And here's why. Let's say I decide to plug in a really negative number, because as you can see, I'm moving down further. Let's say I plug in negative 10. I would have y is equal to 4 times 2 to the negative tenth, so that would be 4 times 1 over 2 to the tenth. Now 2 to the tenth, hold on a second, is 1024, so 4 times 1 over 1024, so that would be 1 over 256. So let's plug in negative 100 and see what happens. I would get 4 times 1 over 2 to the 100. Well, 2 to the 100, that's a really big number. Um, maybe we won't go 100. Maybe we'll do 30, negative 30. So y is equal to 4 times 2 to the negative 30, so 4 times 1 over 2 to the 30th, and 2 to the 30th is 
1073741824. So that would give me the answer of y is equal to 1 over 26843545. But as you can see, I'm still not hitting 0. I will get infinitesimally close to 0 but I will never actually hit zero. So when you draw your exponential function, you come in along the x-axis, but don't touch it, and then you connect your dots, like so. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try one with a fraction. Let's try one is equal to two times one half to the x. So I'll make my xy table. Now before I make my coordinate plane, I'm going to go ahead and calculate some points just so I can see what I'm going to be getting myself into. If I plug in zero for x, I get 2 times 1 half to the 0, so that's 2 times 1, so that's 2. If I plug in 1 for x, I'll get 2 times 1 half, so that's 1. If I plug in 2 for x, I'll get 2 times 1 half squared, so 1 fourth, so that's 1 half. If I plug in 3 for x, I'll get 2 times 1 over 8, so that's 1 fourth. And as you can see, I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm going to go ahead and do some negatives. I'll do negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. So if I do negative 1, I get 2 times 1 half to the negative 1, so that's 2 times 2, so I get 4. If I do negative 2, I'll get 2 times 2 squared, so that's 2 times 4, so 8. And if I do negative 3, I get 2 times 2 to the third, so that's 2 times 8, which is 16. So let's go ahead and make our coordinate plane. This time I'm going to come a little bit lower. Maybe a little bit lower. <laughs> and again, I don't need to go that far over. So 0 gave me 2, 1 gives me 1, 2 gives me 1 half, 3 gives me 1 fourth, negative 1 gave me 4, negative 2 gave me 8, and negative 3 gave me 16. So again, to draw this, I'm going to bring in my curve really close to the x-axis but not touch it, and then follow this up like that. Now you can bring this out farther if it looks prettier to you, however you'd like to do that. Just don't touch the x-axis. And that is how you graph an exponential function. So what we've learned is that if b is a whole number, we're going to go up. And if b is equal to a fraction, we're going to go down. Lesson 7.8, Exponential Growth and Decay. Exponential growth and decay are represented by exponential functions. These are functions in which the variable is the exponent. These functions describe real, real world growth and decay scenarios such as population increases and decreases, plants growing, things being used up, bank interest, team eliminations, and many more real-world situations. 
In order to understand exponential growth and decay, we need to use the exponential function. And there are two forms of the exponential function. We have y is equal to a times b to the power of x. And the variation, y is equal to c times 1 plus r to the t. Exponential growth is an example of a geometric sequence. Now, we had discussed arithmetic sequences earlier. Unlike an arithmetic sequence, which involves adding and subtracting to get from one term to the next, a geometric sequence uses multiplication and division. And we represent any division as a multiplication by a fraction. All exponential growth functions have the basic shape of the graph shown here. Um, the curve can be more or less pronounced. And we can flip the graph. So for example, it could bend this way instead. But the shape will always be the same. Um, some real world examples of exponential growth. Bacteria colonies. Population in an area. Zombies. OK, maybe that one's not so real world. but. Zombies grow exponentially. Um, the basic equation for exponential growth is y is equal to a, b to the x. a is the starting value. This is the first term in the sequence. b is the base, and it has to be greater than 1. Um, this is the growth factor, and it, that's the amount that is being multiplied by each time in the sequence x is the exponent and it represents the number of times b has been applied in the sequence so for example um, if we're on the fifth term of the sequence b has been applied four times so it would be x to x would be four okay here's an example of an exponential function we have the function of x is two to the x in this case a would equal 1, b is 2, and x is just x. Then the x-axis is known as the asymptote, because while it looks like this graph is touching the x-axis, an asymptote is a line that the graph never touches or crosses. but it gets extremely close to. Okay, and um, there should be arrows here. Um, as you can see, this is going to continue to go up and up and up and up and up. So if we do some examples when x is 0, we get 2 to the 0. So that's 1. When x is 1, we get 2 to the first, so that's 2. When x is 3, we, sorry, 2, we get 2 squared, so it's 4. If x was 10, we'd have 2 to the 10, 10th, tenth, which is 1,024. So you can see it gets very large very quickly. Um, and to show how we never actually approach or hit the x-axis, I'll go on the negative direction. If x is negative 1, I get 2 to the negative 1, which is 1 half. If x is negative 2, I get 2 to the negative 2, which is 1 fourth. If x is negative 10, I get 2 to the negative 10, which is 1 over 1,024. And if we keep going bigger, let's say I use negative 150, I'll have 2 to the negative 150. And that would give me, well, quite honestly, a really large number. It's going to give me 1 over 2, sorry, 1.4 times 10 to the 45th. And if I did negative 600, I'll have 2 to the negative 600, which is going to give me 1 over... Uh, let's see, my calculator won't even do that because it's such a large value down in the denominator. But you can see that we 
can never put in a number to where we'll actually hit that x-axis. There is no exponent that I raise 2 to that will give me a 0. This does not exist. And that's what creates the asymptote. We have variations on exponential growth. Sometimes it's not an increase of a factor of b. So for example, we're not multiplying by 2 every time, but rather by a percentage. And that gives us a different equation. y is equal to c times 1 plus r to the t. Um, just to go over this, C is our starting point, so it's the first number in the sequence. R is our percent as a decimal, and T is the length of time that this has occurred in years. So some examples of this type of growth include compound interest in a bank account or on a loan, population, business growth. So when we have our compound interest formula, B is our balance. C was our starting point. Well, in this case, it's our initial deposit known as the principal. R is our percent of interest, and T is still number of years. So if I deposit 3,000 in an account that pays 2.5% interest for six years, how much money will I have? So we're looking at the exponential growth. Now what I need to do is first I need to turn that 2.5% into a decimal. So I move two places to the left, so that's going to be 0 0.025, so that's R. C is my initial deposit of 3,000, and T is 6 for 6 years. So when I plug that in, I'll have the balance is equal to 3,000 times 1 plus 0 0.025 to the 6. We do what's inside the parentheses first, so that's 1.025 to the sixth. Next comes exponents. So I want 0 0.025. I raise that to the power of six. That'll give me 3,000 times 1.159693, etc. So I multiply that by 3,000. And my balance will be $3,479.08. And that's how compound interest works, and that is an exponential function. Now, exponential decay occurs when things are decreasing. This is the opposite of growth. Growth is increasing, decay is decreasing. This is when a population or sequence is declining at a constant rate. And we still use y equals ab to the x. But in a decay function, while a is still the starting value, b is between 0 and 1 instead of being greater than 1. This is the decay factor. So it's the amount being multiplied each time, and sometimes it's a division, but we do multiplication by a fraction. And x, again, is the exponent and is not equal to zero. So we can use this uh, um, equation as well to represent decay that occurs at a regular percent percentage. Everything is the same except instead of adding, we subtract. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, a dish has 212 bacteria in it. The population of bacteria will grow by 80% every two days. How many bacteria will be present in four days, eight days, or 11 days? So let's look at the formula that we need to use. We have a percentage increase 
and that means we need to use y is equal to c times 1 plus r to the t. Now the t in this case is not years, it's every two days. So t is equal to two days. So that would be one t, so two t would be four days. Three, oh, three t would be six, etc. So when two is equal to t, that t equals two, that's four days. When t equals three, that's six days, etc. So in four days, we're going to set up our formula. C is our starting point, so that's 212 bacteria. I need to convert 80% to a decimal, so I move two places to the left. That's 0 0.8, so plus 0 0.8. And I want four days, so T will be 2 in this case. So I'm going to do 212 times 1.8 squared. So first I'll need to square the 1.8, and that's going to give me 3.24, and then I multiply that times 212, and in four days there will be 686.8, so approximately 687 bacteria because we can't have a part of a bacteria. In eight days, t will be four, so I will set up the same equation, one plus 0.8, except this time to the fourth. So 212 times 1.8 to the fourth. So I need to do 1.8 to the fourth first. That gives me 10.4976. Multiply that by 212. And at this point in time, we'll have 225.5, so 226 bacteria, because again, we can't have part of a bacteria. Now here, where T is 11 days, 11 divided by 2 is 5 and a half. So that's what T will equal, is 5 and a half. So I'll have 212 times 1.8 to the 5.5. So I'll raise 1.8 to the 5.5. And I get 25.35. So I'll do 212 times 25.35. It's actually 35121, etc. It goes on and on and on. And I multiply that by 212 and I get 5,374.5, so 5,375 bacteria will be in that dish within 11 days. Let's check another example. Oh, first, I'm sorry, does this represent growth or decay? Well, we started with 212 here. We end up with 5,000, so I would say that that was definite growth. Okay, here we have um, a baby brother with an ear infection, and the doctor said that there are probably 50 million bacteria in his left ear, and the penicillin they gave will kill 7% of the bacteria every six hours. So one T is equal to six hours. Now, we want to know how many bacteria will be in our brother's ear in one day, five days, one week, or in three hours. Well, one day is equal to 24 hours. So T would be 4 there because 24 divided by 6 is 4. And since we're killing the bacteria, that's us decreasing the bacteria. So in this instance, we need to use the 1 minus R formula. So I start with 50 million times 1 minus 0 0.07, 7% converted to a decimal, we'll move two places, and T is going to be 4. So I have 1 minus 0 0.07, that gives me 0.93. So I have 50 million times 0.93 to the fourth. I'll raise 0.93 to the power of four. 
and that gives me 50 million times 0.748, etc. So I multiply that by 50 million. And I will still have, or rather my little brother, will still have 37402600.5, so I'll round it up. So 37 million bacteria will still be in his ear at the end of one day. Five days, well, first we need to figure out how many hours that is. So we'll multiply 24 times 5. Or actually, we don't need to go that route. We know that one day, T is 4. So 5 days, T is 4 times 5. So that's 20. So I'll set this up. So I have 50 million again. Times 1 minus 0 0.07 to the 20th. Well, I know that 1 minus 0 0.07 is 0.93. So I need to raise 0.93 to the power of 20. And that's going to give me 0.2342, and then it continues. So I multiply that decimal by 50 million. And at the end of five days, there's still going to be 11,711,943.7. So we'll raise that to 44 because, again, we don't have parts of bacteria. So at the end of five days, there's still going to be 11 million bacteria in your brother's ear. One week is seven days. So I do 7 times 4, and that gives me T is 28. So we'll set this up again. We already know it's going to be 0 0.93 to the 28. So I will do that calculation first. And that gives me 50 million times 0 0.13107, and that continues. Multiply that by 50 million. And at the end of a week, we're down to 6,553,790.6. So we'll raise that to 1. So we're down to 6 million bacteria. If we had only gone 3 hours, that's half of T. So T would be 0.5 for 1 half. I raise 93, 0.93 to the power of 0.5, I'm going to get 0.96, so let me just write in my 50 million, times 0.9643, etc. And I did round that to the nearest whole number, so there would have still been 48 million bacteria at the end of three hours. Now, we could find out how many days it would take to kill all of the bacteria. We want y to equal 0. So we would set 0 is equal to 50 million times 0.93 to the x. And we would have to solve for x. At this point, we don't actually have the mathematical function to do that, but it can be done. Okay, and did that represent growth or decay? Well, we were killing bacteria off, so that represented decay. Okay, so another example, over the last several years, there's been an increase in the amount of school-age children carrying cell phones. Current estimates are that there are 1,237,000 students in the United States with cell phones, and the amount of children with phones will triple every 10 years. So we're going to use, because we're tripling, that's multiplying by 3. So we'll use y is equal to a, b, x. Oh, I 
actually going to pull down one second. Okay, so we have 1,000 or 1,237,000 students times 3 to the X. Now, we don't know what year this started, so it's current estimates. So since it's currently 2014, I'm going to go ahead and say that that was our starting year. Now it's going to triple every 10 years. Now if we're at one year, T will equal one tenth. Okay. Um, actually, you know what? Let us do this. Let us take this back because of this number. We'll take this back to 2010. We'll say that current year is 2010. So instead of equaling one half, or one tenth t will be one half because it's every 10 years. So one t would be 10 years. Okay, I just don't want to make the fractions too difficult in the example problem. So we'll raise our three to the power of a half. So that means we'll do three to the 0.5 first. So three raised to the power of 0.5 gives me 1,237,000 times 1.7321, actually it's 0, 0,5, and then it continues. I multiply that by 1,237,000. And I actually get 2,142,546.8. So I'll raise that to 545 because just like we couldn't have part of a bacteria, we can't have part of a person. So in 2015, if this number was current in 2010, there would be almost double the amount of people with kids with cell phones. Now if we go to 2100 and we started at 2010, if I take 2100 and I subtract 2010, I have 90 years. If I divide that by 10, that gives me t is equal to 9. So in this instance, I'll raise 3 to the 9th. So I'll have 1,237,000 times 19683. I'll multiply that by 1,237,000 thousand and according to this in the year 2100 it's actually 2.4 times 10 to the 10th so I'm going to actually write this out so I have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 according to this growth figure 24 billion kids will have cell phones in the year 2100. Now, considering that there are not even 20 billion people on the planet, this seems very unlikely. There currently, I want to say, 6 to 8 billion people on the planet. I don't know the exact figures off the top of my head. But certainly not 24 billion people on the planet. And even if there were exactly 24 billion people on the planet, they would not all be kids. So, if exponential growth does not have a cap, it can continue on forever. But the reality is, is that when you talk about population, as population is increasing from new people being born, it is decreasing from people dying, and you hit a cap. Population cannot go above what the, the land will support. But we're not calculating for that, so we'll just go ahead and say there are 24 billion kids in the year 2100 that will have cell phones.